Welcome to Ignite Interviews. I'm Cindy Donahue. I'm very excited to have Don Poffenroth, the founder of Dry Fly Distilling, on the show. Welcome, Don. It's nice to see you. Nice to be here. Thanks for inviting. I appreciate you coming down. So why and when, I guess when and why, did Dry Fly Distilling begin? Uh, we started the planning in 2006, and it was pretty much born out of the fact that I, I was a corporate guy out of college, uh, worked for a the same company, although it had gone through some ownership changes for almost 20 years, and uh, lived in Spokane. It's where I wanted to be. Uh, when I was hired by that company, that was kind of a, uh, an inside deal that I would not leave Spokane because I love my city. And I was getting forced at the end of the game to move to Southern California, which is not a great place to fly fish. So you know, we had a disagreement about that on whether I should stay or not. Uh, so I left. And, and uh, the ultimate result of that was the, the creation of Dry Fly. So when we did that, we wanted to think about uh, things that were Spokane that represented our area. And that re really was kind of a driving factor. So uh, tying the agricultural part of that into our equation was important to us. We wanted... Uh, what we did, whatever that was, to uh, reflect our area. And the tie with these 100-plus-year-old farms was the perfect answer. And what is it about your products that make them unique? I, I think a couple things. Uh, and we strive to be unique all the time. As a small manufacturer, we're not into mass production, and we're not into creating those things. We, we always want to sell more. I mean, any small business does. But I think it's super important for us to um, control those agricultural components. Um, so we really buy all of our grain from two primary farms. They're both over 100 years old. They were both homesteaded in this area. Um, and that farmer connection, I mean, our actual farmer delivers grain to us. We talk to him about crops. We're there at harvest. We're involved with seed selection and and all those kind of things because it all starts there. And if that is not right, then what comes out the still on the other side and and even maybe after 10 years of sitting in the barrel is not going to be right. So that agricultural thing was super important to us. And we wanted to be, you know, Spokane, I guess, for a lot, if that's even a word. But I'm, <laughs> It's I'm a gonna, word now. I'm going to use it. Uh, <laughs> we, we wanted to, you know, we wanted to be... Um, which I think is a core thing of us. We wanted to be a kind and gentle and a community-involved company. And, and uh, you know, we wanted our employees to be there forever. And we wanted to create that environment that, that uh, uh, reflected, I think, Spokane values. And what are the two farms that you work with? Uh, so we use Wysota Farms, which is eight miles east of Rosalia. Uh, Wysota comes from Wisconsin and Minnesota, where the two founder, the father and mother, came from when they homesteaded the farm. So uh, Wysota Farms, that's Mitch Engel. And then we use the Spokane Hutterian Settlement, actually, which is out um, past Airway Heights on Wood Road. So we use them primarily for corn. Uh, everything else pretty much comes through Wysota. Um, from a raw material standpoint, I think our radius is 30 miles. So pretty much anything we use is grown within 30 miles of our facility. And so you're really, I mean, it's a funny thing to say, but you're like farm fresh, right? I mean, you like Yeah, it's I like think food. there's this <laughs> term of uh, farm to bottle, uh, which... Maybe it's probably overused like any other kind of marketing shtick, but um, uh, when we say farm to bottle, that means we're with the farmer and, and literally talk to our farmers our farmers every week. And what are um, how many bottles do you produce of all of your product? I mean, it's you are well, manufacturing. A, yeah, that's a great question. And, and a little bit of that is, is skewed since we got into the canned cocktail business, right? So uh, that, that now is probably 50% of our overall sales. Um, bottles are the other 50%. And, and Dry Fly as a company uh, uh, is on fire right now. I mean, we have we grew 167% last year. Um, I would expect that number to happen again this year. You know, and some of that is just the function of, you know, 14 years of hard work actually finally, finally coming home. And what is it about your team, because you've been expanding and growing, what about your team contributes to your success? That's a great question, and I think that we would not be anywhere near where we're at if, if it weren't for our core team especially. Um, so we, we have uh, Terry Nichols, who is our VP of Sales and Marketing, came from the distribution industry, 27 years of experience in that industry. Um, it's like having a translator on our team. He speaks the language of distribution. 
and, uh, and does it very, very well. Uh, Pat Donovan, who was our very first employee, um, now is our VP of operations and runs our operations. And uh, he's just uh, a great kid. He's an, an owner of the company, as is Terry. So we, we like to engage people and our employees when they get to a certain level to, to be you know, part of our team and to have skin in the game um, so that we all kind of rise together. I mean, it's really, it's talking about being Spokane, which is now a word, by the way, Um, and how you wanted to stay here in your previous role that you had, the job that you had. And so it sounds like you really are trying to make dry flight distilling that for your team members now. It is. And and our team has grown dramatically. I mean, we, we had four employees for 10 of our 14 years and, you know, we have 17 now in our new facility, we'll probably have 40. So those numbers are changing dramatically. And and we're really trying to do the work right now to make sure that we have a a culture and a mechanism to take care of people and do things right and communicate effectively with new employees. And, and uh, I think that's going to be our biggest challenge in the next year or so is finding the awesome human resources. Um, Building a manufacturing facility is easy. Finding great people is the key. Always. Talent is the key. It is. Um, and so tell me about your expansion project. It's a big thing for us and uh, for, for those who have been to our current facility, especially in the last year, have seen that on a daily basis, we literally move 20 pallets of things outside every day because we have no more room. And, and we're operating uh, our equipment at a, a multiple of whatever it was intended to do. Um, I'm surprised it, uh, knock on wood, that it hasn't broken more than it has. Um So this is a needed thing just from a manufacturing standpoint. So we're going to go from a 4,000 or 5,000 square foot facility into our new facility, which is going to knock the door on 20,000 square feet. So um, that has been a long project for us. We have uh, maybe spent the last five years trying to get all those little pieces together. So that comes from site selection through every other possible equation you can think of of the one million pieces to make it all work and uh, some sites failed and there was probably a reason they did because we were supposed to be where we're going and And where is the new facility so it's on the corner of monroe and riverside we're Mm -hmm. basically going to occupy the the uh, part of the press building um, that the coles family had for the uh, review Um, so it's really kind of the side opposite of the spokane club the curve part of that structure um it's an amazing facility. We, we, I'm so glad that we got together and we were able to connect those dots. We being ourselves and in, in the coal slash um, Centennial Development, the real estate arm, um, because it's a perfect use for the building. There should be manufacturing in there. So I think it's way better than having a retailer in there because that building was built to make things. Um, so it fits perfectly. You know, and we have now an objective to kind of pay homage to the history of that inside our new facility and mesh that with all the other little pieces of history we have. So um, this will be a significant change for us. Things get bigger and and maybe to a certain degree a little more automated, which provides some consistency. Um, But the the biggest advantage to us is things get spread out so that we ultimately don't have people working on top of people. Um, It it is going to be, I can't wait to show people. And what are some of the components that will be in the new space? So all, all of our manufacturing will move. So we're, we're literally moving no equipment. This is all brand new equipment. Um, our average tank is is eight feet in diameter and twenty three feet tall. So things get significantly larger um, as we scale up, and that really is just kind of the next evolution. Um, so we'll come out of the gate with about four times our current capacity have the ability to really go to 10 times our current capacity. So we're building in some uh, growth opportunity, just efficiency. Um, you know, in 2.0 is what I call this project. Um, we, we get to correct all the mistakes we made when we did it the first time. We didn't know anything the first time. And now we know what to do and how to kind of you know, dot the I's and cross the T's and make it function at a very high level. Um, so it's going to be very visually appealing and j- just big, cool stuff and <laughs> nerdy cool distilling stuff cool spokane stuff yeah and then the other part of that equation is um you know a, a retail bottle shop for us so and we currently did that in our taster and we, we our taster has been closed since the onset of covid um but this will be kind of a new evolution of that um, we'll have some food service in that equation 
Um, we'll actually have a set of real offices and a conference room and then kind of some event rental space for groups of up to 50. Um, and all those things literally set over the distilling equipment. So it's a very visual um, kind of, we, we want people to feel like they're in the distillery and, and hopefully we'll accomplish that. We've done some really cool things with that project. We sourced all of our um, window casings from Kaiser Mead. So they were built in the 1940s. And again, I love that repurposing and historical tie to things about Spokane. It, it's ways for us to say that, uh, you know, hopefully we can belly up to some of those bars of the institutions of Spokane someday. I mean, it's, it's so obvious talking to you how much you love this region. And I'm curious, why do you think that Spokane is a great place to do business? What about our community or about our city makes it that way? Uh, th- there's a lot of things, I think, that maybe that reflect who I am as a human. So I, I think things like, um, I, I still I love Spokane, that you can talk to anybody in Spokane. That we, we can all have great conversations about things and, and, uh, and not try to beat the crap out of each other and and uh and we can do family things and we can spend time outside and if you're a spokane person and you're not spending time outside you're missing the boat i mean that's why we live here is to get out and and enjoy what we have here and i think it's i've been all over the united states i've never found a place like it uh and i I just like how our community reacts to things i mean uh when this community's down it it uh, responds in a pretty cool way that I think makes us a very, very unique city. Yeah, I think we rally around the people and the connections of the people, but also we support each other. In we all do. The time. We've had like great examples recently, like this uh, Rick Clark's quarantine project, which is just an amazing response of people saying that we have, uh, you know, we've set criteria for our restaurant and bar owners that make their life incredibly difficult, and and. Uh, you know, Rick coming up with the, that simple idea that blew up and all of a sudden became this amazing thing is is how Spokane reacts. I mean, that's what we do. Yeah, we definitely come together. And I know you've loved fly fishing, obviously, dry fly distilling. So what are some of your favorite locations to go well, fly fishing? There's no such thing as a bad place to fish, right? <laughs> and uh, sometimes that's a function of where there's time. Um, I think fishing the Spokane River is an amazing place, and I, I don't think enough people do it. You know, it requires a little bit of thought about access, but um, the Trout Unlimited group in Spokane has increased our access here and made it easier. Uh, and then within a 40-mile radius and even a 100-mile radius, you open up just more and more opportunities. So it is not a function of, of where. It's, it's more a function of can I squeeze the time to get it done. <laughs> if you had to pick one or your favorite location, what would it be? Wow. Uh, I've done a, a trout fishing all my life, so maybe the answer to that is I'd like to, ex- now as I get older, I like to explore different things. So I've kind of gotten into more saltwater fishing and tried to learn those techniques. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity in that. But again, I'm totally happy to jump in a raft and launch right below the Monroe Street Bridge and fish here in Spokane. Um, that to me is like this this combination of words we try to use for dry fly like persistence and patience and to sometimes perfection because it has to be right or it doesn't work your approach and those are all the same words we use at dry fly so i think that's the parallel well you definitely tie in all of your loves your love of spokane your yeah. love of fishing into what you're doing so what are some of your favorite flavors that you have i'm sure that you open up some of your cans of dry fly when you're fishing so. yeah um <laughs> Yeah, there's rarely a time when there's not an open can <laughs> when I'm fishing of something. Um, that, that is an incredibly accurate statement. Um, the best things that dry fly has made, no one has ever tasted yet. So, I mean, that's kind of the, the great tease of distilling. Time is a wonderful thing. And, and as we get older as a company, then we can take more advantage of those time equations. And, and really, that's on the whiskey side of the world. Um, so I think the best whiskeys we've ever made have probably not come out of the barrel yet. I mean, I'm fortunate that we can taste those every now and then and and uh, think about them and try to be uh, patient to let them continue on their journey. Um, everything we make, um, we taste multiple times during production. I mean, it's in those flavors, whether they're in a canned cocktail or just a, a simple bottle of vodka are incredibly important to us and it's one of the biggest challenges we have in this new plant is scaling that 
um, to a high level. And, and luckily, our equipment manufacturer is a 175-year-old company. They're the oldest continuous manufacturer of steel equipment in the world. Um, Christian Carl is the name of the company. They come from Germany. So uh, we're going to lean heavily upon them to help us uh, figure that out uh, because we're not a bunch of scientists, and I don't want to approach it from a scientific standpoint. I, I'd rather approach it from the heart well, it sounds like within everything that you do, that the best is yet to come. So we have yeah. the new space, the new expansion, um, new places to fish. It's all ahead of you. Yeah, yeah. More fishing, less work. That's my, go- that's my goal. <laughs> that's a really good goal. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on Ignite Interviews. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Glad to be here. 